copyrighted program created by Rio Grande. Los Angeles Police calling all cars, attention all cars, broadcast 232 at 832 and one-half East 5th Street, 832 and one-half East 5th Street. See the man. That's all. Rose and a motion picture star and his double may look alike, but they act differently. And so it is with motor oil. There may be a general resemblance in outward appearance, but real lube gives an entirely different performance. Real Lube defies the most extreme heat of the fastest driving in the hottest weather. Real Lube's tremendous film strength can't be broken down. And don't lose sight of the fact that Real Lube contains no petroleum jelly, blood, and other carbon-forming elements which are present in many of the oils you buy. Remember that Real Lube not only is the newest and finest motor oil sold in the West, but that eight major airlines, 150 railroads, vast fleets of ships, and millions of motorists in 45 nations of the world have relied upon this same type of lubricant to protect billions of dollars of motor equipment in every conceivable climate known to man. How much? Only 25 cents a quart. It is the companion product for the gasoline that is first in public service. First in the estimation of those who buy the most and drive the most. First with your city, county, state, and federal government, the Rio Grande track. The story we are to hear tonight was made available through the cooperation of the Los Angeles Police Department. And we have therefore asked Chief of Police James E. Davis to open our program. Chief Davis. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Science is putting crime on the spot. New scientific weapons of defense are constantly being placed at the disposal of the police. Today, few major crimes remain unsolved or their perpetrators uncaptured. Law and chemistry have combined in the laboratory to make it impossible for even the most clever criminals to get away with murder. One of the most advanced and at the same time most certain means of bringing a criminal to justice is the use of the motion picture camera to record questionings and confessions of suspects. It was the use of this device that enabled the police to build an airtight case against the defendant brought to trial in the story we are about to hear. I shall discuss additional developments at the end of this program. The blood-chilling cold of a November night settled into the nooks and crannies of the drab buildings that stood like waiting vultures around the railway station. Their windows, like bleary eyes, peered through the murky gloom at the bent figure of a woman who crept from shadow to shadow along the foggy street. Hiya, Lizzie. Oh, you scared me, son. I didn't see you standing there by your cab. Yeah, yeah. I noticed you were sort of lost in thought or something. Memories, son. Memories. I do my living with them. Memories, Lizzie? Well, you have to be a whole lot older before you come to appreciate how pleasant that can be. Don't you ever get lonesome? Lonesome? Oh, yes, I get lonesome. But I still have my memories. You know, sometimes I think the twilight of living is the most beautiful part of all. Just like the end of a day. Just like the end of a day, huh? <laughs> Good night, son. <laughs> Time an old woman got her beauty sleep. Yeah, uh, good night, Lizzie. Hmm. Just like the end of a day. Hey, what's coming off around here? I don't know, boy. I see the smoke coming out that room up there. Then I phoned the police. That's all I know about it. About what? Nothing. I, I don't know nothing about nothing. Come on, let's take a look. Probably some guy went to sleep smoking a cigarette. Maybe so. Cops got up here in a hurry. Uh, yes, sir. It, it, it's that room right there. What's coming off in here, boys? What's the matter with you, blind? We're trying to put this fire out. But for the love of Mike, hey, that's Lizzie English on that bed. What's that? I said that's Lizzie English. Hey, how did this happen? Well, that's what we want to know, buddy. What do you know about it? Uh, uh, nothing. What are you doing here, then? 
Well, I uh, heard the siren. I saw you fellas come sliding up there and run in, so I drove my cab down here and just come in to see what all the excitement was. Oh, you just wanted to see what it was all about, eh? Sure. What else? I'm asking you that. You don't think I did this, do you? Well, you seem to know pretty well who the woman is. Maybe you can explain what happened to her. Oh, now, listen, you got me all wrong. Sure, I knew Lizzie. I've known her for years. Yeah? Who is she? Just an old derelict who wanders around at different beer joints and pool halls, panhandling a few nickels and dimes, just enough to get by on. I saw her just a couple of hours ago. Where? She passed my stand and headed up this way. She stopped and we talked a couple of minutes and she said she had to get to bed. You didn't see her after that? No, not till I come in here a few minutes ago. Hello, Irvine. What's all the fuss? Hello, Peyton. You got Vaughn with you on this case? Yep. Come on in, Thad. Coming. Irvine and his partner's got the situation well in hand, apparently. Where's Hamlin, Irvine? Downstairs, talking to the bird who owns this rooming house. Who's this fellow? Cab driver. Identified the woman as Lizzie English. Know anything about this? No, I don't. But listen, why don't you ask this guy? He's the one that phoned you, fellas. Come on over here, boy. Come on. Uh, y- yes. We're not going to hurt you. Uh, yes. What do you know about this? Uh, all I know is what I told him when I called up. Well, we didn't get your call, so tell us again. Well, it's just like I told the man when I called. Two people was quarreling down there. So you better send somebody up here and stop them. Where were you when you heard this? In my room. Yes, yes, but where is your room? Twenty-four. Right down the hall there. This is room 20. I see. All right, what else? Uh, ain't nothing else. That's all. Then why did you call the police? Uh, well, uh, I did hear the woman scream. Oh, you heard the woman scream. Now, somebody screamed. Then what did you do? I went to the wife's room. Then what? Uh, uh, that's when I saw the man. What man? The fellow that come out this room. What did he look like? Well, he was about my size. A little darker, maybe. Uh, and had liver lips. Had what? Liver lips. Big, thick lip. Oh. Well, what else? Uh, that's all. Where'd this man go? Uh, he went downstairs, a uh, running. Went running downstairs? Uh, yes, sir. You're sure he came out of this room? Uh, yes, sir, I'll show. What'd you do when he ran downstairs? Well, I called the cop. Why? Well, uh, I ain't never seen that boy around here. And when I heard that scream, and he come running out this room, I figured something was wrong. So I called the cop. Did you see this man before you went into the wash room? Uh, no, sir. It was after. Nobody else seen him? Uh, not that I know, sir. Did you kill this woman? Oh, 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 oh Lord, uh, no, sir. I never did. I, I never killed. I wouldn't do nothing like that. No, sir. I didn't do that. Okay. You say you never saw this fellow before? Uh, uh, no, sir. I never saw him. N- no time. Oh, hello, Patton. Hello. Hi, Brown. Howdy. Just got through talking to the proprietor. What'd you find out, Hamblin? Well, he claims he didn't rent this room to anybody. That makes sense, doesn't it? Come here, Patton. Well, looks like Brown found something. What's up, Sam? Take a look at those surgical clips. That's right. Whoever did this job had a cut on him somewhere. Well, let's give him to Ray Tinker. He can go over in the lab and see what he can find out. Well, we try to find out where they came from. Hmm? Looks like the killer meant to burn the whole place down. Mm, yes, yeah, looks that way. That boy over there hadn't called the police. The joint might have burned. Here's a light socket I found over in the corner. I was wondering what happened to that. Uh, see that wire up there? Hmm. Has just recently been pulled in two. Yeah, and apparently the two wires have made contact. See how they're burning? Uh, hey, boy. You say you were in the hall when you saw this fellow? Uh, uh, yes, sir. By the washroom. Right close to the back of the hall there. Well, come on and show me. Uh, I'll see him run down the stairs. Irvine, where's that taxi driver? He's right outside. Call him in here. I want to talk to him. Okay. Hey, you. Come in here a minute. Yeah, what's the matter now? You seem to have a lot of curiosity about this case. Why? Uh, no particular reason. I know the old woman, that's all. You sure of that? Absolutely. Did she have on a hat when you saw her last? Uh, let me see now. Yeah, I believe she did. Have a purse? I don't remember exactly. I think she did. Yeah, she had a hat and purse all right, Patton. Here they are. Where'd you find them? Under the tub in the washroom. Found these, too. Playing cards, huh? That's right. And unless I miss my guess, they're marked. Didn't you say you were in that wash room? Uh, yes, sir. But, uh, but I never saw them things before. Honest, mister, I, I never saw them before. Oh, well, it isn't the same wash room. It's the one on the next floor down. I'm telling you the truth, boy. I, I didn't uh, have nothing to do with this. Hey, driver, ever see these cards before? No, I never saw them before. Hey, that's the hat Lizzie had on, though. But come to think about it, she did have that purse. Okay. Scram out of here now, both of you. Okay, you know where to find me if you need me. Yep. And, and I live here, boss. You can find me anytime. But I done told you all I knows about this case. Maybe. We'll find out about that later. 
Irvine, you and Hamblin can get back in the job if you want to. Brown and I'll take care of things here. Okay, sir. Call us if you want to. Yep. Tad, what do you think about this? Well, it's uh, obviously murder for robbery. But why? How did anybody ever get an idea that Lizzie English had enough money to even buy a decent meal? She must have had it. Could be some other motive. Not very likely. What the devil are you looking at? Those shoes she has on, uh, something's wrong with them. They do look queer, don't they? I've got it. They're on the wrong feet. What are you talking about? Well, don't you see? The right's on the left foot and vice versa. You're right. That means they must have been put on after she was murdered. And whoever touched them must have left fingerprints. It's about time we got a break. See? What'd I tell you? There's a print on the heel of the shoe. Ah, two of them. Won't Gaskell have fits when we bring this in? You'll be checking prints from now till doomsday. Mm, I don't know. Those prints are liable to hang somebody. Well, let's get this stuff into the lab and get some pictures of this place. How you coming, Gaskell? Any luck? What do you mean, luck? I was behind the door the day the luck was passed out. How far have you gone? Well, I took the mug book and copied down all the L.A. numbers on all the colored boys we've booked in the last six months, and I'm checking their cards now. How many are there? Just 300. 300? Mm -hmm. Yeah. You guys can bring in less information than any bunch I ever ran into. Gaskell doesn't like the homicide squad, Pat. <laughs> You're telling me. Hi, Finger. Why don't you folks stay in your office once in a while? We've got crimes to solve. You're solving crimes? <laughs> don't make me laugh. Gaskell and I have to do all your work for you. <laughs> now, look, Ray. You string along with us, and we'll bring you in a nice suspect for your movie outfit. If as and when you do, you have something. Aside from this cheerful banter, what have you found out? Well, in the first place, those surgical clips show traces of cells from definite Negroid skin. That's what we figured. I'd say that whoever wore those clips has been cut or stabbed recently. Mm, that means checking the hospitals for anybody receiving treatment for cuts. I happen to know where this particular clip comes from, so maybe you can find out from the wholesale house who or what hospital bought the last shipment. They haven't been used for a long time. That is, they're obsolete clips. How about the hat and purse? Definitely bloodstains on both of them and the plane coat. Think I'm going to check all the prints on those cards? You're nuts. Now, keep your shirt on, Gaskell. Just go ahead and find the guy who made those two prints on that shoe heel. Fat chance with you Scotland Yard dick shooting off your mouths around here. Incidentally, those cards are marked. Plus, Thad, to find that out. He's been holding good hands too long not to recognize things like that. <laughs> <laughs> but listen... You know, I can't figure out why Lizzie went to the room like that. The proprietor swears he never saw her or rented a room to her. Well, she might have gone up there with a bird who killed her. But why? That's your question. You answer Hot it. Hot dog! So are you talking about food, or have you found something? Okay, detectives. Here's your man. Wesley Jackson, alias Wesley Coleman. Gaskell, I knew you could do it. Yeah? Don't kid me, cop. Boy, this baby's really got a record, hasn't he? Next time you bring me 300 record cards, I'm going to start at the bottom. That bird was the last one in the pile. According to his record pa pile. According to his record package, he's got an ant in Toledo. It's north. Do I get my ticket here? Are you reading his record or calling trains? Looks like this boy's gone places since he left his native Alabama. Well... Armed with photographs of Wesley Jackson, lieutenants of the Los Angeles police communicated immediately with law enforcement agencies in every town where Jackson was known to have been. His picture, copies of his record, and the information that he was wanted record, and the information that he was wanted for murder was broadcast throughout the country. Almost a month had gone by when in Tucson, Arizona, the, the same three officers who had brought about the capture of John Dillinger sat looking over lists of wanted men. James Heron, C.A. Wine, and James Brady were about to start another manhunt. Brady? About to start another manhunt. Brady? It's about time we hick cops got busy again. Well, I see Los Angeles is looking high and low for that boy that killed the old woman down on 50. That's right. And I got a hunch that we'll find him right around Tucson. Hmm? What? He's a cotton picker, isn't he? Hmm, <laughs> so what? According to this circular, he's been in this country before. Worked the cotton field. We got a lot of cotton to be picked up. We got a lot of cotton to be picked around here. Now, I'll bet a new Stetson will find him. Howdy, Joe. 
How's the cotton crop this year? Oh, Jim, couldn't be better. Yeah, you got a lot of boys picking for you this week? Well, about 20, 25 maybe. Why? Looking for a boy that killed a woman over in California. Name's Jackson, Wesley Jackson. You know him? Uh, can you say that I do? Haven't got any boys by that name around here. Where are the boys now? Over by the bunkhouse, playing blackjack. Well, let's mosey over and have a look at some of them. Hmm? Sure thing. You got a picture of the boy you're after? Yeah, yeah, here it is. Uh, Ever see him? Uh-huh, maybe. Yeah, is that all of them, that bunch over there? Well, maybe two or three of them are asleep. Some of them went in swimming a little while ago, but that's most of them. Uh-huh. Hey, you see that boy dealing? The one with the thick lips? What yeah. about him? Look anything like that picture? I'd say it was the same man. So would I. Call him over here, Joe. Okay. Hey, Shorty. Come over here. Would you wolf? Never mind. Come on over here. Better be ready for quick action if he gets tough, because you're going to get it. Don't worry about me. You want to take care of him if he decides to fight. I'm ready. I'll just get in the wind, Mr. Joe. What you want with me? This is Officer Heron from Tucson. He wants to ask you a few questions. What about? Your name Jackson? No, sir, it ain't. What is your name? What all you want to know for? We're looking for Wesley Jackson, and you fit the description. Well, my name ain't Jackson. Now, take a look at that picture. You ever see anybody that looked more like you than that bird does? Well, what about it? Is that your picture? Yeah, it's mine. Now look at the back. I'm looking. What does it say? It says, Wesley Jackson, Elias Wesley Coleman. Well, what about it? Jackson. Okay, it's me. What you want me for? Now, you don't know, do you? No. Well, make it murder. That's as good as anything else. No, I ain't killed nobody. You didn't kill an old woman back in Los Angeles? I ain't been in Los Angeles in over a year. You better take a look at that picture again, Jackson. It's the date on it. Because according to that picture, you were arrested for burglary less than a month before that woman was killed. You got anything to say about that? No. Looks to me like you were in Los Angeles in less than a year. Well, maybe I was. But maybe you committed murder on the morning of November 8th. I didn't kill nobody, I tell you. You ain't got nothing on me. Are you willing to go back to Los Angeles and try to convince them of that? <laughs> sure I is. I ain't done nothing to be scared of. Well, in that case, you won't have any difficulty in proving your innocence, Jackson. Of course I won't. Honest, Mr. Hen, I never kill no woman. Why, any man that kill an old woman like that ought to be hung. Maybe you're right, Jackson. Maybe they will hang you. <laughs> December 16th, scarcely six weeks after the murder, Lieutenant Patton returned to Los Angeles with the suspect. He was taken to Central Station and booked for murder. Then began the long hours of questioning in an effort to determine the man's guilt. Once more, the crime detection laboratory came into the picture, this time for a dual purpose. In a brilliantly lighted room in the old Central Jail, Wesley Jackson sat at a table and talked to Lieutenants Patton and Brown. Jackson, do you mind letting us see your shoes? No, you won't find nothing on them. Maybe not. Here's the right one. Won't the other one? Not right now. Here you are, Pinker. See what you can find on that one. Just a minute. Let me pry this heel plate off. That ain't going to do no good. Now let us worry about that. Say, what's that grinding noise? What grinding noise? It ain't exactly a grinding noise. Sounds like an electric fan. Jackson, how would you like to have a moving picture made with you as the star? Mm, that's a swell idea. Well, that's what's happening right now. That whirring sound is a movie camera. You sure you won't mind if we take your picture while we're talking to you? <laughs> no, that's a swell idea. Just like a toast. You haven't been promised anything for doing this, have you? Me? No, I don't want nothing for doing it. Nobody promised to let you go if you came up here and talked to us, did they? Sure not. I know the rest of killing that old lady. How about that test, Pink? Ready right in a minute. How did you like Arizona, Jackson? Now, that's a swell place. Talk to any officers down there, Jackson? Yeah, talk to that fellow who arrested me. Tell him anything about killing Lizzie English? I didn't kill no Lizzie English. Don't know no Lizzie English. Okay, don't get excited. Got it, Pinker? Yeah, all set. Jackson, see those test tubes on the table there? Sure. Explain it to him, Pinker. Well, this tube has a solution of the scrapings I got off your shoe under the heel plate. This one has metal in it a little because I scraped it off the plate itself. Now, on this slide are scrapings from both of them, the plate and the shoe. We put the slide under this microscope like this, and we compare it with a slide like this. And we find that both slides show human blood. That ain't so. That's a lie. Take it easy, Jackson. Where'd you get that slide there? That one came from the place of Lizzie English. 
Uh, that don't prove nothing. You're right. Well, he's right. By itself, it doesn't prove anything except that the two slides contain blood. I was a little hasty in saying it was human blood. I don't know that yet. We'll take the test tubes and add a little of this benzidine solution like this. And we get a distinct green. That does prove something, Jackson. Yeah? What? That proves that the scrapings from your shoe contain blood. So what? You ain't proved it's her blood. Now, stick around, Jackson. Now, we take these test tubes again. Take a little of this solution here. What's that, Ray? Well, that's a serum taken from a rabbit that's been inoculated with human blood. Now, if this test tube contains human blood, it'll react and become cloudy when I drop the other solution into it. Like uh, this. It's cloudy. You're right, it is. And I can say conclusively that the scrapings taken from the shoe and from the heel plate contain human blood. Hmm. Well, we've got your cold, Jackson. You better come across. Well, uh, I guess uh, I might as well unload. Yes, I guess you might as well. Is that camera still running? Yes, Jackson, it's still running. Uh, yes, I might as well make a good picture of this, uh, hadn't I? Yes, and make it as good as you can. Uh, where are you all going to run this picture? We're not sure yet. Uh, can I get to see it? I wouldn't be at all surprised. Now, before you start talking, nobody's threatened you or beaten you to make you do this, have they? Beat me? No, nobody's going to beat me. We just want to get that point clear before we start. Go ahead, Jackson. Well, I'll stand down on Fifth Street, close to Gladys Street, when this old lady comes up to me. And she says to me, she says, Pardon me, young man, but could you tell me where I could get a room real cheap? Huh? Uh, was you talking to me, ma'am? Yes, I, I said, do you know where I can find a cheap room for the night? Why, uh, uh, sure. Uh, yeah, you can get one right next door. Oh, thank you so much. Uh, uh, wait a minute, ma'am. Uh, tell you what. I know the man that runs this place. He's gone to bed now. But, oh, well, as a matter of fact, I helped him run the place. I'll show you the room myself. Well, if it's all right... I want to be sure. Oh, it'll be okay. Don't worry about that. Well, all right, then. Let's look at it. Oh, seems like an awfully long climb. How far is it? It's on the third floor. Oh. Take four now. Oh, I see. Uh, is it much farther? Oh, just a little ways now. Oh. Here we is. Here's the room right here. Oh, phew. I'm all tucked out. Haven't climbed that many stairs in years. Just go right on in. Oh. Yeah, I'll turn the light on. Well, it ain't much of a room, but I guess it'll do. How much is it? A four bit. For this dump? Take it or leave it. Well, all right. I, I, I'll take it. You'll have to pay now. All right, all right. You go on. Get outside. I have to get the money for you. Okay. Such places they put a body in nowadays. Here. What are you doing in here? I said get out. Give me that money. What money? What are you talking about? Get out of here. I said give me that money. No. This is all the money I got in the world. I've saved and gone without to save this little bit from the last days. You wouldn't rob a poor, defenseless old woman of all she has. That's what you think. Uh, Give me that money or uh, this will be your last No, I won't do it. What are you taking your shoe off for? Get out of here. Help! Uh, Shut your mouth. I told you to give me that money. Our scene changes. It is the courtroom of Judge Dudley S. Valentine. The time, several weeks later, an attorney speaks. Your Honor, the prosecution has introduced a signed document purporting to be a confession of the defendant to the crime with which he is charged. We move, Your Honor, that this so-called confession be thrown out on the ground that it was obtained by force and duress, that the defendant was in great fear of losing his life, and that officers, in this case, used brutal third-degree methods to obtain this supposed confession. Look at that man sitting there. Does he look like the despicable killer that these burly officers have said he is? Obviously, this frail boy 
would sign any sort of confession to preserve his life, to escape from further brutality on the part of the police. Is that all? That is all, Your Honor. Motion denied. The prosecution will present its evidence. Your Honor, I would like to present a motion picture at this time. The motion picture? Yes, sir. We've set up a screen in the machine over there with loudspeakers. We'll present positive proof that this man made this confession of his own free will. I object. Overruled. Proceed. All right, Mr. Pinker. You've been sworn, I believe. I have. Will you relate how this film was made? It was made in the central jail at First and Hill Street. It shows the defendant, Wesley Jackson, and the officers, Patton and Brown... And I the... object. The film itself is the best evidence of who was there. That is correct. Objection sustained. Proceed with the exhibition of the film. Yes, sir. Shut your mouth. Give me that money. What did you do then? Well, she wouldn't give me the money, so I told her I was going to take it. I pulled off my shoe. Had steel plate on it, or on the edge of the heel. I started to beat over the head with it. What did she do? Well, she didn't do nothing. And finally, she sat down on the edge of the bed and started to scream. I hit her till she stopped screaming and fell back on the bed. Then what? Well, then I tried to find a little cotton bag she had and the money in. Did you find it? Yeah, I found it. That's when I got blood all over my hands. I wiped them off on the covers and took a hat and a book. Did you leave then? Yeah, I left. I was nervous. Went down to the corner and bought some cigarettes. Lordy, have mercy. Went back up to the room. I figured I'd set the place on fire. But I didn't have no matches. So I pulled off the light socket and held a piece of paper up to the wires and lit the paper when the fuse blowed out. Then I lit my cigarette and just dropped the paper down on the bed and walked out. In just a moment, Chief Davis will conclude our program. Ladies and gentlemen, when your local officers and federal G-men spring into action against society's most fiendish enemy, the kidnapper, they must be prepared for any emergency. They arm to the teeth with the most modern weapons known to man. And these include not only firearms, but up-to-the-minute automobiles powered with the surest firing, speediest pickup, fastest, most powerful gasoline that money can buy. Rio Grande Cracked is that gasoline, say your public servants, an overwhelming number of whom depend upon this finer motor fuel to power the law enforcement equipment of your city, county, state, and federal government. Joining these officials in praise of Rio Grande Crack are tens of thousands of well-informed motorists. You, too, will be numbered among this loyal, enthusiastic army of boosters if you'll give cracked gasoline a chance to prove that it delivers more miles, quicker starting, smoother acceleration and maximum power, further acceleration and maximum power, further acceleration and maximum power and speed. Pull in at your red and white Rio Grande station tomorrow for a tank full of police car performance gasoline. Rio Grande Crack. The motor fuel that is first in public service. And now, Chief Davis. Wesley Jackson was convicted by his own testimony. The irrefutable testimony as recorded on the sound film. No longer could he claim that his confession was obtained by the third degree. The picture clearly showed his willingness, even eagerness, to talk. This same willingness to talk sent him to prison for life. Thank you, Chief Davis. Senators, please calling all cars, attention all cars to cancellation broadcast 232 regarding a murder. Suspect in this case is now in custody. That's all. Rose and Bush. This is your narrator, Frederick Lindsley, bidding you good night for Rio Grande. <laughs> <laughs>